here's your host, Alex Garrett. You know, it's kind of funny here on the Alex Garrett Podcast Network how life keeps uh, stored away for a moment till it's it's ready to come out again. Meaning, I just referenced the National Publicity Summit where I met my next guest, Andrew Bernstein. Andrew, it's been a few years, but my goodness, it's glad to finally have you on my podcast. Well, it's good to good to be here, Alex. Thanks for having me on. And I remember uh, at the event, and then we got to talk a little bit. I I love that event. I don't remember well, but I do. It was a great event. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do remember it well, and I really I admire Steve Harrison and his whole team, and you know, and the work that they do in putting that together. I thought it was a great event. One of the reasons why I brought you on now is because we're in a crucial time with the education system, kind of letting the kids run the campus, mainly the anti. Israel anti-Semitic kids, if I may, run the campuses. And I feel like you want to change America's education for this very reason, so that nonsense doesn't happen on our college campuses as the kids get older. Yeah, the the uh, school system today does much more indoctrination, you know, with leftist propaganda than it, than it does with education. And it's this has been building for 100 years, going back to John Dewey and his peers, uh, you know, around the time of World War One, and it's it's reaching a, a a fatal climax right now. I think these are good kids; they're good American kids, but their their academic training has just been been woeful. I mean, many of them struggle just with the mechanics of reading. So how are they gonna how are they gonna read primary sources in philosophy? Uh, they, well, the answer is they can't, and they certainly can't write. Most of them can't write a college level essay. So it's really and they like they don't know the first thing about American history, never mind world history. So uh, uh, and, 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 and this deterioration of, of the American school system, Alex, it was done deliberately. It was, you know, they, they dumbed it. They dumbed it down deliberately. They, you know, they even say so. They don't believe in academic training. They um, or, or the, let me just briefly explain um, the the conception, I think, that dominates the teachers colleges and the, the modern, you know, the. The training of, of modern teachers is very elitist, and that is, you know, you a hundred years ago, the um, IQ tests had just come in, so you know, IQ, you could IQ test the the children. You can't do that anymore; it's considered racist. But you look for the best. The idea is you look for the best and the brightest. They get the full academic program. They get math and science and and literature and history. They, you know, they they're taught phonics to learn how to read, and they're going to be society's future leaders. In the, they're going to Governed in the legislature and in the classroom. The rest of us, you know, ninety odd percent of the population, we don't, we don't need much academic training. We're going to be, you know, the, the what we need is vocational skills so we can be good workers for society and obey the wise rules of the state. That is the that was the the conception, and so it's still that may not be the the positive program anymore. You know, in the school system. But but the negative is still there. The anti-academics is still there, and that's it was it's done deliberately. And don't forget Dewey and those guys, the progressives, John Dewey, William Hurd Kilpatrick at Columbia University in nineteen twenties. Where did they pilgrimage to find the education system that they thought was ideal? They pilgrimaged to the Soviet Union uh, uh, because they wanted to see the education system that trained students to to serve the state, to put the state first, not their own selfish interest. And so that's been the goal uh, in the broad sense of the American school system since. And the negative is uh, predominant, and that is the anti-academic mentality. But you could see, I could see it every day in the classroom. These poor kids, they don't know anything. The college kids, they should not they should have had a much better education, but but they don't. So it's, it's very sad. And so I'm guessing you're not on board with the whole idea of teaching sexual education to kindergartners. The school should be the one place in society that focuses on training the kid's mind, training the kid to think, uh, you know, basic basic thinking skills, reading, you know, reading effectively, writing, basic arithmetical and mathematical calculation, you know, and, and content in history and science and literature. Uh, how, because there's any number of places outside of school what kids can learn other things. They want vocational training. They can go to vocational schools or they want to be a mechanic dad or their uncles can show them how to work on the car. They want to play sports. You know, there's literally, you know, there's karate studios. Uh, they want religious training. There's all kinds of churches and synagogues. Uh, 
why can't schools, how about this? Schools be the one place in society that focuses on academic training. So sex education, I think, should be left to mom and dad. I think there's a lot of things that should be left to mom and dad, including ethics and hygiene and you know, and thing, and, you know, and things like that. A second of all, these kids are way too young to get any sex education. Should be left to mom and dad, and mom and dad should should do it when the kids go through puberty and they can start to understand, you know, sexual feelings and everything. When they're five, six, seven years old, it's just an idea to them. They don't they don't have any feelings, you know, to uh, to match with with the idea. It's way too young to uh, to teach kids sex education. So it's just error piled up piled upon error. Mm -hmm. And the and the whole idea here is to is to make sure that that this is not left to mom and dad. It's to uh, it's a it's a institute a breach between the kids and, and their parents because these are basically basically Marxist, you know, uh, virtually communist ideas. And that is your life belongs to the state. The kid's life doesn't belong to mom and dad. The kid belongs to the state. And when the kids grow up to be adults, their life belongs to the state. It's a, I don't, I don't think the American left is quite yet communist, but I think they're trending strongly in that direction. And I think they're training, they're training the kids from a very young age to be indoctrinated little leftists and they're pushing us within 20 or 30 years. I think we're going to, you know, we're going to, they, well, they're going to be ready to push us into a communist totalitarian state. One look at the John Dewey bio, and it kind of scares me because he says there was a belief in democracy and education. Now, I don't think the state and education should be hand in hand. Do you? No, I think there's a lot of data showing that uh, education should be left. Mom and dad should, should control education. Education should be in private hands. Uh, spe specifically, uh, mom and dad should control. There's a lot of data showing us historically that when education was left in the hands of parents, it tended to flourish as, a, as opposed to education in the hands of the state, where it tended to deteriorate into, a, in, into indoctrination you know, of service to the state. Andrew Colson wrote a really good book on this uh, market education. He goes all the way back to the Greeks and contrasts, you know, Athens, for example, where education was in the hands of the parents with Sparta, where education was in the hands of the government. And then comes forward historically to show there are some good signs, you know, Alex. Um, homeschooling is growing in, uh, in, in the country. There's the rise of what's known as micro schools. You know, in my book, uh, why Johnny still can't read or, or write or understand math and what we can do about it. I focused on, on this. Micro schools is really they're small community schools because a lot of teachers in the school system, and I think of them as the government schools because any private school is open to the public, but these are schools run by the government, funded by the government, and, you know, and so on. Um, so a lot of teachers, the best teachers get burned out and they opt out of the system and sometimes, but they want to teach. And sometimes they contract with a few of the parents to start a small school, a small community school in one of the parents' basements or so. And they're called micro schools. And, you know, Forbes magazine ran a story on this a year or two ago. I think, you know, the um, on the micro schools. And it's considered the return of the one room schoolhouse where you have a teacher, you know, usually a woman, sometimes a man, you know, with a few families. So there's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten children, you know, students. And, uh, and, and, Andrew, and you, are we seeing are we seeing a walkout of teachers that are given this certain curriculum and say, I can't teach this? Are you seeing that at all? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know how large it is, uh, but it's definitely happening. Uh, and usually the best the best teachers, the ones who really want to teach, you know, you know, who have this funny idea that the kids need education, not indoctrination, not indoctrination. Um, the, the knee plus ultra of that was the great Marva Collins, of course, who uh, opted out of the Chicago school system, 1970s, and started West Side Prep in Chicago. And she took all of these black kids and minority kids who were considered uneducable by the school system. And she just, you know, uh, with a lot of with tough love combined with tender love uh, and a lot of phonics to teach reading. She educated these kids to be really, really, really strong readers who were. Uh, who did well on all tests, went on to college. Um, West Side Prep flourished about 50 years. Unfortunately, it closed, I think, I think after, mm -hmm. after Marva Collins' death. But uh, she showed, you know, and, and a few other great teachers. There are good movies, you know, re real life movies made about this. One is the Marva Collins story, which I recommend to everybody. Cicely Tyson and a very young Morgan Freeman as her husband. Uh, Stand and Deliver, story about Jaime Escalante, you know, Barrio. 
there's a, there's, there's a, a, a few of them uh, um, where you see a dedicated teacher take kids, minority kids generally, uh, black, Chicano, whatever, uh, and, and you know, the school system thinks can't be educated. And with, with, you know, with a combination of, of very high expectations and rigorous training in math, you know, phonics and reading, you know, helps educate these kids to be really, really, really good students. And, um, but the school system... The school system is heavily against this kind of academic training, and many of them get burned out and leave the system, like Marva Collins did. Uh, so I think there is, I think there is. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how big it is, but there is a movement of teachers, usually now you are, teachers, out of the schools, out Andrew, of the public schools. Lecturer, but you were also in the classroom for many years as a professor, and and what? I still, I still am. In fact, right after this interview, I have to head to class. I have a logic class this afternoon. I'm trying to teach so, logic to students who struggle with with reading, so it's hard. So, as a professor who's sort of common sense minded, do you find it a challenge going up against every other professor that you may be dealing with, or 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 see around the country? I mean, is it like a challenge to get these kids to focus now because of the other professors in the college world? Yeah, the poor kids come in. On one, and there were some exceptions, but they come in good kids, but they come in one generally with poor academic skills. Uh, and I, I mean, and I mean, actually, mechanics of reading and certainly um, writing. You can't, most of them can't write. A lot of them can't write a coherent paragraph, never mind a college level essay. And, the, you know, I'm in, I'm in the humanities. I'm a philosophy professor. But my, you know, my colleagues in the math department tell me the same thing, that these kids come into college needing a lot of remedial work in math. So the academic skills are weak, very little knowledge of content. I don't know the first thing about history. And three, uh, have been indoctrinated, you know, with uh, Marxist propaganda. So I hear, you know, I hear from the students, I hear them talking amongst themselves where they make some, some comment as if it was the most obvious thing they ever heard. And it applies to the israel uh, Hamas conflict now about the evil white man who goes, uh, you know, around the world stealing everybody's land. And it's, um, it's complete propaganda. I mean, the, 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 there's some truth to it. But it's funny when a logic class now, and I heard it from these kids, this is a gigantic example of a half-truth fallacy. Because so what about the rest of the world? They're, they're a bunch of bunch of you know, nice, you know, non-aggressive, you know, victims of the evil white man. And, and so I'll tell them, well, let's let's look at what the Mongols have done historically. Let's look at what the the Islamic world has done historically. Let's look, take a look at what's going on in North America. With the American Indian tribes or Native American tribes long before the Europeans ever arrived. It's endless warfare and aggression, imperialism, and, and, you know, and it's just endless. And so picking on the evil white man doesn't distinguish, if, if you know the history, doesn't distinguish him. But you know, like I say, uh, no worse than anybody else and often better. And that doesn't even, even get started on the great achievements of Western civilization that have, that have been life-giving to people, you know, in medicine and agriculture and so on, and are life-giving to people all over the world. So, yeah, they come in uh, little academic skills, little knowledge, and a lot of propaganda. So, yes, it's difficult to... Talk with Andrew Bernstein. He's a professor now. Remind me of the, the college where you're at right now, because you have a long resume, if, I, if you will. Yeah, uh, Marist. Marist College. Oh, great. I love that. I have a couple of friends that graduated from there. And Marist normally is a pretty upright school in, in that sense. But I guess you're seeing a different trend up there. Now, the, the other thing about um, what you're talking about here is, is when it comes to logic, are you uh, philosophical logic or what kind of logic are we talking about? Well, it's, it's it is a philosophy class. So, yeah, it's uh, basic, ba basic Aristotelian logic, you know, the uh, the syllogism, the logical fallacies, and you know, and so on, and so on, and so forth. So it's it's a basically an introduction to uh, classical logic, to Aristotle's uh, achievements in the field. Have you lost any respect from your peers because you sort of go against on what maybe some are teaching, or are they all on board? Like, how does the university react to your curriculum? Because I'm sure you have to submit it to them, right? Yeah, oh, Marist is better than than most. It's less. It's less leftist, but I teach at Dutchess Community College also, and um, yeah, there, you know, it's uh, it's it's often more it's often in the in the public schools it, it, it's often it's often more of a battle. Although Dutchess also is is less leftist than, and I've had um, allies in the administration who who su supported me against 
you know, some of the students who were very, 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 I, you know, what my syllabus st stood up strongly for freedom of speech. And uh, there was a student who took exception to that because she, she said, you know, it, it enables hate speech and hate speech leads to violence and it makes me feel uncomfortable and you know and, and your job is to make me feel comfortable and everything and i said my job is to teach you logic uh and i you know i strongly support freedom of speech and the administration backed me on this so i was very i was very happy about that but there are a lot of schools around the country where and in the and the ivy league schools i mean harvard evidently is one of the worst where uh if if you if you don't if you're a conservative or a libertarian or or you or you 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 uh, strongly support Western civilization, uh, uh, or you support Israel against Hamas. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of pressure on you from from other faculty members, from uh, from from some of the students at, at times from the administration. And we see uh, you know people canceled in the university. The funding is cut, or if they're not tenured, they will lose their lose their jobs, uh, or they're so harassed that they. They just leave Peter Bogosian at Portland State a couple of years ago as a philosophy professor. They left. I know you have a few minutes left, so I want to get into this. Uh, you teach or you lecture about Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, and I have to read the whole thing, but I do love the story of Atlas and how he carries the weight. Ayn Rand's book is about how we're all sort of turning a blind eye to what's going on, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Atlas Shrugged, I think, is... To me, I've thought I've thought so since I was a 16 year old high school kid. I think it's the single most important book in anybody's education. Now, first of all, it's a brilliant novel with an amazing plot structure. But the way Ayn Rand dramatized, you know, an entire philosophic system in the story—it's not just talked about; it's it's shown in the events of the of the story. And um, it, I mean, the, the the theme here, of course, is about. The human mind that our intelligence not manual labor which is the marxist view but, but our intelligence is the is our survival instrument the, the 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 means by which we we create you know the values life requires whether we may make advances in agricultural science or in, in medicine or you know great works in literature or the arts or whatever it is the mind is the means of 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 how human beings flourish on this earth and the mind requires freedom. The mind requires the principle of individual rights. It can't function under dictatorship. It requires political economic liberty. And we're being pushed into dictatorship, especially by the left. I think the conservatives are, are guilty of this too, just not as egregiously. And you know, the freedom of speech issue, Alex, is the is to me is the is the core. And the left, especially the conservatives too, to some extent, but the left is, is, is at war with freedom of speech and there should be a huge up, uproar in this in this country. I mean the Biden administration established a, a a governor's board of disinformation and homeland security last year. And unfortunately, you know, there was some blowback and, and it got knocked down. But it's terrifying. That's all Wells Ministry of Truth. The government doesn't get to decide truth or falsity. I think it's crazy. Some are saying, no, give these law students their jobs because they're advocating for Hamas. That that's just freedom of speech, is it? Though I think it's inciting violence. The principle here in, in metaphysics, you know, about the the nature of reality, nature of the universe, and that's to be is to be finite. Uh, and even free speech has everything has limitations. Even free speech has limitations. And I don't think I have the right, you or me or anybody has has the right to uh, incite violence to say go out and kill so you know so and so. And Hamas is. Say it's a terrorist organization is an understatement. The um, it's that it's it's explicitly dedicated to the destruction of the state of Israel and and killing the Jews. That's this is who they are. You know, we need to, like you said before, we're turning a blind eye. We need to listen to what uh, Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran uh, and various Arab Islamic organizations and nation national leaders say. They're open. They want to destroy Israel and they want to kill the Jews. Uh, and this this is part of, of Islam's history, by the way. Uh, but they're I open saw that you it. wrote a Facebook post about this. And where can people find your public posts about all of this? Well, on my on my Facebook page, you know, you know on on Twitter. Although I post on Facebook more often than than on Twitter, or on my LinkedIn page. Um, but uh, yeah, the these jihadist. Uh, governments like in Iran or, or organizations like Hezbollah and Hamas, they're open about wanting to destroy 
Israel and kill and kill all the Jews. So support for them is support for mass murderers. And so, yeah, I, I think I think that this freedom of speech has has limits. I don't think I don't think you could openly support, you know, Hitler or Stalin or Mao or somebody. You know, so let's let's put these Nazi or communist dictators in place and, and murder millions of innocent civilians. No, I I think uh, freedom of speech has has its limits. So so and oh, I, I like absolutely. I mean, you can't yell fire in a theater, but this is way worse than that. So um, I just, yeah, you know, I you know, Alex, I think I think Ayn Rand made a really good point in this when she said, when you see civilized men fighting savages, you support the civilized men. I got to ask you, because well, another reason why I brought you on is because I've seen your education experience. I saw your article, um, which was featured, by the way, uh, which was villains and heroes of the American education system. And that gives me hope that you're talking about how we can prevent little kids from becoming indoctrinated. And I think that's where your goal is at with that article. Yes, I'm going to keep you know, stressing this, that the, the purpose of schooling is to educate the mind, not to indoctrinate kids with a certain political philosophy, to educate. What we see today in the, in the American school system is a deadly dynamic here. And that is, since, since many of the kids struggle just to read, uh, you know, and they, and they don't know any history, they're much easier to indoctrinate. For example, since they don't know any science, and not to only science, it's easy, it's easy to indoctrinate them with the man-made global warming, you know, catastrophe, that there's a climate crisis. Now, I've written a, you know, I've done a lot of research on that. I've written a booklet on it, The Truth About Climate Change, and there is no climate crisis. It's, it's, it's all leftist environmentalist propaganda, but the kids don't know any science. And so, you know, they hear it everywhere. They hear from their teachers, they hear from their college professors, they hear it on CNN, they hear, hear <clears throat> excuse me, the Democratic Party. <clears throat> and they just believe they hear it from celebrities. They hear it from nobodies who make themselves into celebrities like Greta Thunberg. Uh, you know, they hear it everywhere and they don't know any science. So how are they going to how are they going to combat, combat it in their own mind? And, and when they struggle, <clears throat> I mean, I've, I've always been a bookworm around. So I did all this research on climate change. I read all of these books by climate scientists and geologists and, you know, and and astrophysicists who study the sun climate connection. And I had a ton of data, but these poor kids can barely, you know, a lot of them struggle just to read. How are they going to combat the propaganda? Well, they can't. When you go on tour lecturing, are there a lot of uh, different views represented? Meaning, do people disagree? Who disagree? See you lecture? Do they come up to you and and sort of pick your brain? Does it ever get violent? Like, what is it? What is what are your lectures like? A lot of times, there's a lot of people who, who just don't want to hear something they disagree with. So if I go give a talk on the virtues of global capitalism, very often the, the leftists who, who uh, hate capitalism won't show up. Sometimes they do, and, and it's better than they don't because they, they're disruptive. They, very often they'll yell and scream. I remember a talk on global capitalism I gave University of Massachusetts. When was that? December 2011, I think it was. And um, that's back before Antifa, thank God. Um, that's back when Occupy Wall Street was the leading leftist organization on campus. And they yelled and screamed and, you know, and, and you know, it took hours to finish the talk because they disrupted it so often and security was so slow in escorting different factions out. So, yeah, sometimes they get violent. Uh, they'll throw, you know, they'll throw stuff. They'll certainly curse and, and, and issue, issue threats. I've been threatened many times. It's interesting with the conservatives. They tend to be more civilized. You know, I, uh, as a strong supporter of individual rights, I support the right to abortion. And I gave a talk on the right to abortion at Texas A&M about 20 years ago, which is one of the most conservative schools in the country. And the kids disagree with me, but they sat and listened. Um, you know, they tend to be religious you know, Christians, and they, they sat and listened, and, and then they asked questions in the Q&A, some of which were, were hostile. But they didn't disrupt the talk. They didn't yell, scream, throw garbage and stuff. So, you know, I have my disagreements with the conservatives on a number of issues, but I think the left is vastly more dangerous and more, you know, more virulently uh, opposed to freedom and freedom of speech. One last thing. At what point do we not tell, do we not say, well, it's education's fault. It's the kid's fault. He's old enough or she's old enough now to know what she's saying. I mean, there is an ignorant part on these uh, generations after you and me, isn't there, that they just don't want to learn. 
Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, as adults, we have responsibility for our own lives. You know, mom and dad might have done all kinds of bad things to us. You know, I, you know, I came out of a crazy family, you know. Uh, the school system may have deliberately tried to cripple our, our minds. But by the time we're adults, we have to take responsibility for our own lives. And, and uh, uh, it's not hard to improve our reading skills. Reading is not difficult for anybody who's uh, got a healthy brain, which most people do. Can, you know, can upgrade the, our reading skills using phonics and then can read on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Read on the history of Islam. You know, read about, there's a, there's a lot of books written by you know, uh, AGW skeptics, scientists skeptical about the man-made global warming hypothesis. There's a lot of material that we can read. And even, you don't even have to read in some cases. There's a lot of YouTube videos, which is better than nothing, you know, by people who are outside the mainstream, who uh, disagree with the, uh, leftist propaganda and, and and we could and if we're messed up psychologically one of the good things about modern civilization is the field of psychotherapy exists it didn't in the past uh it's expensive and it's a it's a long process can be painful but what price mental health right we could take responsibility need to take responsibility for our own lives as as adults and that, that includes uh enhancing our education do students turn to you even if they're not going to marist to say hey my professor's failing me because he disagrees with me. Do you, are you seeing that a lot? You know, students will ask me, you know, what to do. And I'll always say, well, you know, first thing to do is try to reason, you know, with, with the professor. But not everybody op is open to reason. And uh, mm -hmm. I tell the kids a lot of times, uh, get to know who the professors are. The other students know. You find out from them. And if you have to, just keep your mouth shut. Uh, you're not required. Isn't that crazy? We have to keep our mouth shut if we do, if we disagree with the professor. I I just thought that wasn't academia today. Yeah, that should yeah, supposed academia. to be supposed to be a bastion of free thought, um, but it isn't. And they have, in in effect, they have your grades in their hands. They could, you know, they they could do you harm, and it's it's tragic that very often you have to self censor. Uh, you know, and I and I say that if you have to do it, you know, in your own mind. Think, you know, in your own mind, think of the arguments that you would bring against what the professor is saying. And then when you graduate and you're not under their thumb anymore, you're not in their power, then you speak out to any forum that's open to you on social media, you know, uh, in private with your friends or family or colleagues. If you're going to be a writer, you know, you write, you know, you write op-eds or an essay, but in any forum open to you, then speak out loud. For academic, you know, for freedom in academia and against the dogmatism and, and the cancel culture that we that we currently see so dominant. And you could use your own example, you know, your own case, and you could mention names, professor, you know, because these guys are bastards. Professor so and so did this to students, and I had to shut up in class. You know, I had to self censor. You know, these guys deserve this this kind of censure publicly. So you know, speak out in any form open to you, and let and let them have it. Speak the truth. Stand up. You know, does great with the college tours is Ben Shapiro. I don't know if you follow his work, but yeah, you yeah. know, he always goes on the campus and uh, you two should go on a tour together. That would be kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I have my disagreements with, with, with Ben Shapiro, but uh, like I said, the left is vastly more dangerous to individual rights and political economic liberty than the conservatives are. So I generally agree. With, and, and the, and the, the left the culture and the culture wars to me, the left is, is, is criminally insane. I mean, I mean you, you know, uh, we were discussing the anti-free speech cancel culture mentality, which is despicable, but, you know, defund the police. Now, defund the village idiot could understand that if you defund the police, the crime rate, the rate of violent crime is going to go up. And if the idea is to save black lives, it's going to have the exact opposite. In, in some of the black urban neighborhoods with this high crime, you, you defund the police, the crime rate is going to go up. And it has. Heather McDonald, the crime expert, has pointed that out over and over again. Uh, Rashida Tlaib didn't just want to uh, defund the police. She wanted to eliminate it, the police and replace it with social work. You know, and, and part of her jurisdiction is Detroit, where, you know, the, the, some neighbors, the rate of violent crime is, is heavy. Uh, so, you know, they're insane on that issue. There's dozens of different genders we can... We can pick any gender we want, and little kids can be mutilated on the, you know, on there and their parents say so, sexually mutilated, and uh, when when they're children, which is just is just evil. 
Uh, and of course, it's almost a minor point relative to these other uh, things, but biological males can compete in women's sports and uh, really uh, terrible injustice to great female athletes who've trained so hard to be so good at their events. Now they have to go against men, your biological men, who tend to be bigger, stronger, faster, and so on. The left is insane. <laughs> you no, I didn't bring you on to advertise Maris, but I got to ask, would you say in your professorial, professorial career, is Maris one of the more fair-minded, like, you know, we will hear you out if you have opponent, opposing views in your professor type of college, or, or how does that go? Yes. Yes, definitely. Marist is uh, is is definitely much more open to freedom of speech, to, to intellectual disagreement, to real diversity. And uh, you, you real di real diversity should should be in intellectual diversity, and um, not racist. You know, not um, uh, admitting students whatever on on the basis of race. Uh, real, you know, uh, but I think you know, students should be admitted on the basis of merit whether they're black or white or Asian or Latino or biracial or whatever it is, race doesn't, rationally, race doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. We should be colorblind individualists. Uh, but intellectual diversity is important. And that is everybody in college and higher education should be exposed to all, all different ideas, all different theories, you know, and, and so on and, and so forth. So, you know, I tell the students, look, if you're an atheist, you should read Thomas Aquinas and his arguments for God's existence. If you're a strong theist, you should read Frederick Nietzsche and his arguments against God. If you're a strong supporter of capitalism like I am, we should read Marx and Engels. If you're a communist, you should read Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. We should read the people who, who most effectively challenge our most cherished beliefs because one, we might learn something from them and we might change our mind. And two, even if we don't, in, in encountering the arguments and, and, and in, in seeing the counter arguments and seeing the flaws in their arguments, we bolster our original judgment you know, with more knowledge now because we've, you know, we've gone up against the intellectual enemy and we've, uh, you know, encountered and answered their arguments. So the, I the feel like higher, education, be... higher education should be a, a fountainhead of uh, wisdom and, and uh, open mindedness to every, every type of argument. All right. One last thing. Um, talk about reading. Uh, the left is is complaining about book burning, but it seems like the books that are being burned are not good for the the, the child's mind, right? And that's what I'm seeing anyway. Book burning. Uh, well, yeah. Here's where the conservatives, you know, I don't know about burning books, but they want to they want to ban certain books. But the but the left is always in the vanguard of this. I mean, they're the ones who want to want to ban books. Huckleberry Finn has to be banned because it's racist, uh, which it isn't. But from, from their standpoint, it is. To Kill a Mockingbird has to be banned because it's about a white savior, you know, and so on and so forth. They're the, they're the worst. The conservatives are, are, are also contribute here. But the leftists are the worst about banning books. So I, I agree with that mentality, with that principle. Read banned books. And you see people with a, you know, wearing the, wearing it uh, even on their forehead. Uh, I read banned books. Absolutely. I tell my students, if, if a book is banned for that reason alone, I would, I would read it and, you know, and, you know, and, and discuss it. Uh, now, now some books. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you're in the elementary school and, and the, and the books are, are sexually explicit, I don't think, I don't think kids, you know, when they're five, six, seven, eight years old should be reading that they're not ready. They're not ready for that. They're not sexual beings yet. Wait till they go through puberty and they can have some, make some assessment, have, have some feelings about sex. Now, right now, it's just an idea to them and they don't, and, and a very remote idea. They don't, they really don't have much of an idea about it. They certainly don't have any feelings about it yet. You know, when you get through puberty, uh, you're in middle school and certainly by high school, you know, you can read sexually explicit material, but in first grade, I mean, it's inappropriate. It's just not, it, they're not ready for it. This has been really enlightening and really uh really great to catch up with you andrew and uh do you have a, a twitter or a facebook where can people find you well my website is uh, andrewbernstein.net and they could see you know all the books i've written and you know and, and a lot of the essays i've written so my website is just you know andrewbernstein.net my facebook page my you know my my twitter page they could find me you know they could find me there also but uh, i think most of the information about me is on my uh is 
is on my website, which again is andrewbernstein.net. And you see the different books that I've written. I just published a booklet uh, just last week on racism, American racism, its decline, its baleful resurgence, and our looming race war. So it just, just came out. Maybe maybe we could discuss it at a future date, Alex. Would love to have you back on. And thanks for giving people a perspective that you're not really hearing anywhere else. And that's why I like to bring on people with those viewpoints that should be uh, voiced again. And thanks again for joining me, uh, uh, Andrew. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me on, Alex. It's been fun. Uh, this has been the Alex Garrett Podcast Network. We'll talk to you soon.